Welcome to another episode of The Swiss Show. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Tuckwood. Today's guest is Mr. Aaron Sansoni, aka Mr. Empire, the man who built an empire by starting, building, scaling, or investing into over 50 companies to date. That's pretty impressive in itself. Um, he's an international speaker, best-selling author, and nominee for Australian of the Year 2017, and Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year 2016. He's also the founder of the Aaron Sansoni Foundation, uh, which is currently raising funds um, with the help, um, with the aim of building a pediatric emergency department in Melbourne, Australia. Um, he's an internationally acclaimed speaker who has spoken at some of the most exclusive venues around the world, and share the stage with the best of the best. I'm jealous of this lineup. Um, billionaire Sir Richard Branson, um, Hollywood A-lister um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and world-leading speakers like Tony Robbins, Gary Vaynerchuk, Tim Ferriss, and even Dr. Tim, uh, Dr. Eric Thomas. Um, finally, Aaron has inspired the lives of 250 million people. Um, he has coached 350,000 students in 107 different countries from over a hundred different industries um, on and offline throughout, throughout his mentoring career, which spans 15 years. Mr. Aaron Sansoni, welcome to The Swiss Show. Mate, thank you so much for giving me a little bit of your time today and uh, uh, looking forward to having a conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And, and I apologize for having such a long introduction on that there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a lot, you have to remember, right? You do really well. <laughs> well, well, Matt, yeah, I'd love to say that I remember that, uh, but you probably don't know. Um, the, um, the reality is you have such a long intro because you've done a lot. Um, and when I, I started to have an eye on you as a potential guest for this show, um, and, I, and I've definitely created a hit list, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, I looked at your backstory, which we'll go into, and, and it did start very, very young um, as an entrepreneur, um, all the way back to almost the age of 13, if not before. So um, I'm sure we can dissect a little bit of why that intro is quite uh, substantial, but also absolutely merited. Um, but, mate, just... For those people that might not have heard of you, maybe um, just uh, give us a quick 60 second um, informal intro to who Aaron is. Yeah, sure. I'm an investor. Um, I'm a best selling author, and I think you covered the, the majority of it. I think right now, what I do is uh, I I run a couple of venture capital firms. So I, I start businesses, uh, I invest uh, into companies, I buy companies out, or I become an equity holder in them. And everything from big stuff like being a, um, a private equity holder in SpaceX with business partners like Elon Musk um, to, uh, to listed companies, and all the way down to you know, small companies that might do six figures uh, a, a year where I've either started them or I've grown them or I've um, invested into them as well. So I have a day that's full of a huge variety of different stuff that I get to do uh, in my investment world. So investment is one thing. Yeah. A portion of my life, I also dedicate to uh, to teaching people how to grow uh, an empire, right? So that's multiple <laughs> businesses, with multiple income streams inside those businesses. So I, I kind of do what I teach and I teach what I do. And the mm. third part about me professionally is uh, my foundation, which you mentioned as well, which my wife and I started four or five years ago. And uh, we've, we've been, been, uh, been blown away with the, the impact we've been able to have in a short period of time through our foundation. Both my wife and I grew up you know, with, with, with underprivileged circumstances, uh, um, both her from migrant family and she came over when she was two to Australia and both my parents came over when they were younger from, uh, from their countries as well. So we both, you know, grew up with not much. So we kind of knew that we wanted to do something when we were, were in a position to be able to, to, you know, to affect people, to impact greater as well. So that's my life. That's what I get to do at the moment and, uh, and get to hang out with you and all of your amazing people watching and listening this. Yeah, amazing, right? Um, well, if, if we may then, let's, let's let's go back there just for a quick second um, with the the, the the childhood and I say your parents moved over here, sure. um, but um, born, you're Mel Melbourneian? Yeah, yeah, right? Melbourneian, yeah, born and raised Melbourne. We own the title for the most lockdowns uh, in the world. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really pleased about that. I have to add that to my intro. Aaron comes from Melbourne, the most yeah. lockdown city in the world. Uh, so yeah, born, bred Melbourne, uh, grew up here. Uh, those of you that, that, that might be listening or watching that are from Melbourne. So I grew up in uh, a place called Fern Tree Gully, uh, which uh, sounds nice, but it's a shithole. And uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, and so I grew up there and, you know, it's, you know, the, 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 the challenge from, from the beginning, my parents divorced when I was two uh, and uh, my father struggled with drugs and alcohol his entire life. And my mother made the decision to not be around that and left with, with uh, three kids, no job, uh, no money, no car, no family, because she's an only child. 
um, and tried to build our life uh, from from the beginning. So absolutely came up without having mm-hmm. anything and having to learn learn my own way, um, my own way through it, and then eventually finding mentors, which completely changed my life, which is really one of the reasons really why, you know, a lot of my friends, Ryan, that that do venture, venture capital like me, and they make a ton of money, they go in their boardroom, I've got a boardroom that's, you know, 10 feet away from here, I can go do a deal and close seven figures uh, in my venture capital firm. And a lot of my friends are in the same kind of game. And they see me hopping on planes and traveling the world and speaking at events. And they're like, why do you do that? You know, why do you go on to give mm. so much? Because no one really teaches about building empires, right? No one actually teaches. And I actually started off teaching sales, by the way, which I love. I know, yeah, yeah. The king of sales, no, one really, no one really teaches it, right? So yeah. I, 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 so I, I, I'm a big believer in this and in people listening to this, I think that if you're listening to this, then you are absolutely ahead of the game just by listening to this kind of stuff and being a part of this. So because I, I, I know how much this stuff impacted me and I didn't know there, there weren't podcasts around when, when I first started, but I had to read eBooks and real books. Uh, but for me, I know how much this impacted me, which is why I dedicate such a proportion of my life now to, to really passing it on and showing people the things that you just don't learn in school. You don't learn in university. Uh, you don't learn in MBA school uh, and people don't teach. You know, my first coach said to me, my first business coach, Ryan said to me, choose a business, do one thing and get really good at it and do nothing else. So I, I fired that guy. Cause I'm like, I want an empire. <laughs> you know, I don't want to have one thing. I want lots of things and I want to do it really well. So yeah, that's a bit about me and, and 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 what I get to do now and and um and 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 again, I'm just such a big fan of of people trying to change their life through learning like this and listening yeah. to podcasts like yours. Yeah, and what, and what I like, um, and you said it earlier as well, like you you do what you teach and you teach what you do, um, and I think there's a lot of coaches um, out there these days that, that maybe they they sell their training but they don't live their training, um, and you also alluded to mentors in the middle of that now. Uh, Forgive me if I'm wrong here, but your your parents split when you were young, and then you yeah. you lived with your mum, but then you went to live with your dad. And yes, yeah. yeah. my parents split when I was two. Then I I, I lived with my my mum from two till five, and then from five till eleven I lived with my dad. I basically primary school with my dad, and uh, and and then from uh, the uh, kind of grade six, I think I was halfway through grade six. I then moved back with my mum, and then I would live with my mum until I you know kind of left or was you know kind of gently kicked out of home time to go Aaron <laughs> time to leave now Aaron right yeah. uh so yeah that was my that was my my upbringing yeah, positively transitioned you were yes uh, <laughs> yeah something so, like that that sounds a fancy way of saying it <laughs> yeah somebody somebody said that's how I uh, how you're supposed to fire people you, you positively transition them into an into a new role totally, I um, agree. Would, would your um so would you say then your entrepreneurial beginning um was it was it from your father who he, he was like he started lots of businesses or had a lot of ideas was that the kind of my the- dad my dad my, my dad has some things that that I, I i don't think are desirable for a dad but he also got some things i think are very desirable for a dad yeah. my, my father absolutely gave me my entrepreneurial spirit listen i remember you know you mentioned my first business when i was 13 my first businesses were probably when i was five hustling you know um in in the back streets of furniture gully my dad my dad had a business every second week he had a business right so i remember back in the day you know when there was video easy and blockbuster i'm sure you remember some of those and uh, my dad used to go and buy the you know the, the dollar movies that were for sale And we had tons of them in our house and send us door to door to go and rent them to our neighbors for like 20 cents a day. It was, it was the best. Click completely not legal, but, um, but the best. And then, and then we'd have to go collect them. We'd have to go get paid. You know, imagine five-year-old debt collectors, you got to pay. Right. (laughs) So, and and so, you know, that was, you know, that was one of my things that I I really love and respect about my dad is that he really did um, open me up to, um, to the possibilities outside of working nine to five, working for somebody else. Mm. Uh, and I was never against working for somebody else. I just was against not pursuing things that grew my life. And, sure. uh, and, and I think that that's where I got it from. So yeah, I mean, I started, you know, and, and milk crate, um, the, uh, the soda businesses back then used to have the soda delivered um, in, in milk, in these milk kind of milk crates, you'd have to deliver it and left on your door. And, and we, we did that. We did newspapers. We did, you know, absolutely everything you could think of dog food deliveries, everything. My, I, I definitely got that from my dad when I was younger, he, um, he started lots and lots and lots of things. And, uh, and I, I got my, I got my streak from him. And you worked in Maccas as well. In the, in the oh, I worked in Maccas. 
Yeah. Do, you know how, do you know how to mop? No. How you mop, right? So Ryan, you and everyone else that's visually watching this, I learned how to mop at McDonald's, right? I got there and I took the mop out. I'm splashing on the floor. The guy's like, no, no, there's a, and he pulls out an SOP, right? Yeah. <laughs> SOP. I'm like, what the fuck's an SOP? No, one pulls out the SOP. He's like, go to mop like this. I'm like, that's how you mop. You know, it's like you're doing some kind of salsa dancing. So yeah, all I remember from McDonald's is I learned to mop and, um, I'm pretty sure I was fired from Maccas too because I just kept not following the process yeah. of what everybody else was uh, was doing. But yeah, I worked at Maccas. I was a Maccas boy. Uh, yeah, I've, 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 I've had some fun jobs along the way. <laughs> where, where, where would you consider then your first foray into, into sales? Because as you said, you've, yeah. you've, you've previously coached and, and still have an element of sales coaching in there um, as well. Uh, yeah. Where was the first sales job and when did you... Look, I, well, I, I, I think for me, I, I learned really early on that sales is 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 biz, is everything about business, right? Yeah. The lifeblood of business is your cash flow. Your cash flow is coming from your sales. So, and as you start to get, that's a very true statement when you're starting businesses and you're growing businesses. The statement changes a little bit as you have a scaled business because you have to look at margins. And one of the things I always say is, and, and my, my saying is volumes, vanity and profit sanity. And a lot of people, they fall in love with their, oh, I've got, a, I've got an eight figure business. I've got a nine figure business. I turn over 10 million. I'm like, well, how much do you keep for that? You know, yeah. how much I, fell, I fell into that trap. You know, and, and, and yeah, and everyone does, right? So for me, so for me, um, I, I really early on, I, I would say selling, I, I learned, I learned having to go to door to door and do all that kind of stuff I did with my dad. But I think my first proper job job, um, I, I, I think we probably, I, I was, I talked my way into a couple of jobs that you had to be 18 for, and I was like 17. And, uh, and you had to be able to have a car because you used to have to drive around, uh, to go and oh, I did retail, but, but so probably retail before it when I was underage, I did retail. That was my first sales job that I did. Um, and I got obviously commissions and stuff for working at what are like Giordano. I worked at Giordano, I worked to hold up Amy, I worked at Amy Insurance. That was probably, but I'll, but they were some of my jobs that I did. But I think the first proper sales job where I really went, I can need to learn this stuff was I did, um, I did, I worked for a company back in the day when it was commission only and you were, you were sent out to like business parks or shopping centers or like a, a, a stretch of houses. Um, and, and you just had to go sell whatever you were selling. So we sold everything from credit cards to insurance to um, adventure stuff. And we did that. And that, that gave me a punch in the face around sales because I, I, it was, it was, it was like knock, 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 hi. Or it was like trying to stop you in the shop shopping center. Excuse me, ma'am. Can I talk to you? And, and I, I, right, I sucked at sales. Oh my, I sucked. I was so bad. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, this out there garrulistic person. So I wasn't great to begin with. And then I was trying to be everyone's best friend, you know, and you know, the whole, you know, in sales, you know, the best friends finished last. Mm. Um, and so I, yeah, so I sucked, but I, I'd say my first couple of jobs were, were properly in selling with, with, with that. And that was hardcore sales. That was hardcore sales, right? Being able to like knock on a door and go and try and sell someone something, you mm. know, at their business or in their home was, was where I really worked out, uh, a lot about myself and a lot about rejection, a lot about dealing with people that tell you to, you know, go fuck yourself. Why are you doing this? Who are you? And I hadn't dealt with that before. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was an 18 year old kid and I had mates and people around me, but I never dealt with that kind of rejection of straight to your face, closing of the door, you know, like I never had that before. So, so yeah, yeah that was probably some of my first jobs were my first proper sales jobs were with that back then. And I, you know, I, I sucked at it. As I said, to begin with, I wasn't really great. And I started to learn and everything I'd learned um, I, it was, was from a lot of the people that created sales training in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And amazing as those people were, for me learning how to sell, uh, you know, you know, this is, you know, this would have been 2000, right? Um, so 20 years ago, I, it just didn't work. Hi, I'm Aaron. Do you have a moment to speak to me? You know, people don't like that shit. It doesn't work. And I, and I, so I, I, I realized I had to change it up and I didn't realize at the time, Ryan, but I was actually creating what was then to become the first course I ever taught, which was mm. called 
the sales king, the ultimate system, right? So I was known as a sales king. I got globally known as the sales king. I was this young guy in a suit with hair. Um, and I was going and teaching people around the world about sales. And I was kind of like you, I was, I was one of these people that were teaching. This was, this is 2000, early 2000s. I was teaching how to sell in the 21st century, you know, like I was trying to go, because a lot of things I was learning, it just sounded like shit. It just sounded like you're going to try and like knock on the door and the whole process. And for me, I kind of thought, hang on a second. If you, you're selling a product and service is selling something that somebody, you got to find what they want, what they need. You know, it's an exchange of value for money and you're helping them. You know what I mean? Sales is helping that person. Mm -hmm with what they need. And if they don't really need to buy the thing, then move on to the next prospect. There's a lot of people that are around there, you yeah. know? So I, I, I wasn't great at sales and I, and I tried to overcompensate with being really, really friendly all the time. And people just wrote over me because I didn't know how to ask for the business. I felt embarrassed around that. And then people would ask for a discount. I didn't know what to do. And, and I just, I just, I, I was a lot better in customer service than I was in sales to begin with. And I wanted to be in sales because I saw the, 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 the opportunity to be able to make money. So for me, that's where I kind of had to re, I reinvented what I was being taught. And of course, later on in my journey, which I'm sure we'll talk about is, is when I started to actually go out there and, and accidentally run, I accidentally became a mentor. I accidentally became a, a speaker. I didn't go to speaker and mentor school, right? Mm -hmm. um, now I have one that, that teaches people because again, it's one of those things that, you know, you learn from people how to be a speaker and they've only spoken in front of, you know, their family. Um, and, you know, they're not spoken in auditoriums. So I, I think for me, I had to learn how to sell because I, I wasn't making any money, right? I remember going my first job. I would work for six months, no, um, a commission only. I made nothing. I made nothing. I had to spend money on petrol and bus fare to go to places. I was down on a job, right? When was the last time any of your listeners or viewers were down after working somewhere for six months, right? It doesn't, even if you're making shit money, I was down, right? I'd lost money in six months by working there. So I had to, I had to change. I had to learn. I had to learn how to be able to get better. Uh, and, and, and that's when it changed for me is, 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 is deciding I, I, I need to make this work. How do you sell to people without sounding like the, you know, the cassette tapes from the fifties? The yeah, amazing. Um, there's, oh, there's so much to dissect in there. If I just want to go back to one specific moment, you said that you were befriending people. And I talk a lot about getting in the friend zone in a, in a sales environment. Um, what's, your, what's your take on how you got out of it? How did you get out, with it, uh, get out of it without totally breaking rapport and, and losing the authenticity of who you actually are? Yeah. So when I teach sales and I do teach that a little bit now, I don't, not as much these days because people come to me because I'm the empire guy. People come to me because I want to learn to have multiple businesses and multiple income streams. Those that want to have one business and just do that for the rest of their life. Honestly, I'm not their guy, right? I'm like, just that cool. Do your thing. But if people want to kind of become a, an empire owner where it means you've got multiple businesses or even one business, but you don't need to be in it. Like you do, you're in what I call a number three, which is, yeah. which is where you don't need to be in it. That's what I teach, but I still do teach um, sales. And I very first started to teach sales all around the world. And I teach, uh, you know, in a nutshell, three major things. I talk about engage, enroll and convert. And I have my own kind of methodologies and, um, and, and um, IP around how I, how I do it. And in, in a nutshell, I, I, under, I always understood that what I call the buying path, that the buying path is from hello, right? Through to, I need you to buy something. You want to buy something. I want to get you to you know give me money. You're going to get the good or the service. And then we're going to create a relationship. And I had to manage the buying path. And I think what I did really poorly is let's say I had a 45 minute meeting with somebody. I would spend the first 45, probably 35 minutes trying to build rapport with you to make you and I feel comfortable. And I, and I wasn't nervous about going to the next step. And then what would happen is when I was, cause I was running out of time, I would be, I will try and then, you know, skip to the mustard. I'll be like, oh, and they're like, oh, oh, and let me show you my product now. Let me get my product for you. Okay. So you can, and I missed the middle part. I engaged and I try to convert, but the middle part, which is the most powerful part is enrolling where you understand what they need, why they need it. And I created some technology and questioning that no one really had done before in the industry around how you find out what I call their convincing reasons to buy now. And there's, so I'm, I, I love to train people so well 
that they become technically good, but they can, but they can be themselves. So they uh-huh. kind of know the process. They know the step by step by step that they're following, but they're technically good, but they can just be themselves. And if somebody uh-huh. talks about their favorite band, they go, Oh my gosh, I remember them. I was there. But when I talk about this buying path, right. I talk about going, engaging, enrolling, converting. And I learned really early on engaging is really important, but here's the thing. If you and I talk straight away and you and I always have a lot, a lot of connection fibers already because you teach people, I teach people, you love sales, all that kind of stuff. You know me, you've watched me before. So I don't have to spend 30 minutes if I was trying to sell you something talking about you, your family, your kids, that that, but I don't, I don't need to do that. But if I didn't know you, if you and I completely different and opposite, I might need to take a little bit more time to get into rapport. Now I call, I have this thing I call connection fibers, which is like a deeper level of rapport. And I talk about, not everyone needs to have 10 minutes of rapport or 20 minutes of rapport. Some people only need a couple of minutes, but then you don't go from that into closing. You go from that into really uncovering what their convincing reasons to buy your product or your service are. Because here's my thing. When it comes to pitching, you don't have, to, you shouldn't be pitching anything kind of going, will they say yes? Will yeah. they say yes? You should know they're going to say yes or no up, up front. And I also don't believe in product pushing or service pushing. So if your product isn't right for them, then I then give them one that is, if your company offers multiple, if it doesn't, then say, you know what? Thank you so much. I really enjoyed hanging out, right? Honestly, I don't think we might be able to help you today with what we've talked about, what you've shared with me so far. I don't think it's going to work, but can I ask you a question? Is there anybody else that you think that might actually be able to benefit from this kind of a service or a product? Mm. And get a girl out of them. Yeah. Don't even pitch. If they're not yeah. right, if they're not right for it, but we spend so much time going engage, 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 jumping around like a fucking caricature. And then we go, do you want to buy? And then we try and turn it over in the objection handling stuff. Mm. But if, if you do it right, like I teach people when they get to the time that they're, they're converting, if, if they get to that point, that person can, can have any objection. I show people how to be not be afraid of objections. Why? Because they already know every objection that they could possibly say. And they've already found the convincing reasons why each one of those objections will be able to be overturned if they say it. So I'll give you an example. If they go through the whole sales process and the worst thing they could get is, um, I can't afford it, got to speak to my partner, whatever it may be. If they followed my process right now, what I call my sales, called sales mastery, my process, if that person says, oh, it's too oh, it's too expensive. Oh, I need to. Oh, I need to. Whatever they're going to say, they're not going, oh my gosh, anxiety, what am I going to do? They're like, they're sitting there going, just say it. Say it's too mm-hmm. expensive. Yeah, I, yeah. Want, I know what to say. So you tell me, and, and you can't give someone some pre-fed line of it's too expensive. They've got to uncover within their conversation how to overcome that person's objection, bespoke overcome that person's objection with what Mm. they say so for me the engaging part's really important but the enroll section where you're finding out really why they absolutely need it that's where the money is that's the goal that's what most salespeople miss and that's the reason why they miss out on on a lot of deals because they go from engage to trying to pitch and convert they get an objection and they spend all their time trying to beat the person up in their objection. And it's not a fun state to be in. Ah, no, it's demoralizing. It's a state to be in. You know what I mean? If you're going to bend someone's arm behind their back to get their credit card out of their wallet, then you're not going to enjoy doing sales. And they're going to, they're going to have what's called cognitive dissonance, which means where they don't feel connected with, with what decision that they've made. They're the ones that call up and say, hey, Ryan, listen, um, I thought about it and I don't I want to cancel my order. Mm. And why do people keep canceling? Why? Because you're rushing or bullying people into buy as opposed to letting them find why they really need it. And this is where the art of the sales and the science of the sales comes yeah, yeah. as well. So I, the, I, I didn't know that stuff. I, no. knew, I knew nothing about the middle part. I, would, I was told to engage, then say it's going to cost you 10 bucks and then try and deal with an objection after it. Yeah. And, and uh, that was not what I was taught. Here's why. In the 50s, 60s, and everyone wants to know why this has changed. 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, less competition in every industry, in every industry. So if you were trying to sell mugs to people and you were trying to sell 10,000 customized mugs that said MAIA, Massive and Immediate Action, you had no choice. There was only two or three retailers. But because there's so many people selling now, there's so many people that can buy anything, there's so much competition. 
you have to find out what their convincing reasons to buy are from you because there's so many other people that they can go to. But back in the day, 50, 60, 40, 30, 20 years ago, you could mm-hmm. just, hey, how are you going? You're looking to buy some stuff? Great, I can sell you some. I've got some pens. You want to buy a box of them? Yeah, okay, let's convert. But you had to get better at sales in the last 10, 15, 5, 20 years because there's so much more competition. And here's the bad news. It's going to get worse. Now for my next question. Yeah. It's going to get worse. Do you know that 80% of youth in, in America, Australia, and the UK want to work for themselves? And you know, in the last 12 months in Australia, the UK, and America, we've had the highest rate of brand new businesses being registered in the history of mankind. So if you think you're going to get less competition, you're absolutely wrong. So for me, I, I had to learn, and then I had to go and learn from other people, and then I had to go and kind of adapt it to my own, work out what worked, and then go out there and, and build my own sales career. And then I became a leader and a director in sales. And then after a while, I just accidentally became, you know, became a mentor. Yeah. Oh, man. So, so much in there. And, and there was one phrase that you used that really stood out for well, a few, but um, bespoke objection handling, like the, the idea that you cannot premeditate and pre script how you're going to deal with a particular objection. Yeah, yeah, you can create little time savers and, 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 and thinking time. Yeah. But the only way you can truly deal with it is if you've done your the discovery or the consult or the enroll stage correctly. Um, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Um, talk to me about your first seminar um, to 2000, early 2000s. Um, yeah. I, I, well, firstly, I, I would call it a seminar. Let's be okay, honest. Okay. Uh, <laughs> My first uh, meeting in a room with a flip chart with two people. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, because because um, I'm always interested in this because it, you you've you've come from a bit more of a hustly background. Like five years old, you were you were selling. Um, so there, there's a there's a different background to me. I, I did more of a traditional route of school, um, college, university. I was an engineer for eight years in the UK. So I'm not. I'm not supposed to be a salesperson and I'm not supposed to speak on stage in front of a thousand people. That's for sure. Right. There's, there's too many variables in that room for me. Yeah. Um, so I was terrified until 2017 slash 18. I got a public speaking coach, a guy named Harry Singer that you may have heard of. He works with, with Tony Robbins and, and, and all those, um, those amazing people. And, um, and he was able to show me a process like, and you touched on it earlier on that's that speaking just like sales is a skill. Um, and it's something that can actually be enjoyable how did you get on in front of a, in front of a room with a white flip chart? And how, how did you feel in that moment? Because I know we have a lot of listeners that are terrified of speaking and getting their message out to everybody else, which debilitates their chance of growing their business. Yeah, I hear. So look, I, I look, so for me, I, I was working in a job and I got good at sales, right? And then eventually um, I had someone, one of, my, one of my managers said to me, Aaron, we want you to be a leader. And I'm like, okay. So I became a leader. I had a team of a couple of people, like three, four people. And and I said, okay, they were like, okay, can you teach us, Aaron, how you're doing it? So I said, okay, just follow me. Some people love that. Like me, show me what to do. I'm all mm. over it. My wife and other people like her, and maybe even you, because you're the bit of an, you're the engineer background. She's a left brainer. She's super yeah. smart. Was a ducks of school. I was like, isn't ducks a fucking cricket term? I don't know. And <laughs> so she was super smart. So she wants to structure the breakdown. The how do I do it? And the thing I wasn't like that, right? And so if I was trying to teach you when you and I were, you know, twenty years younger, you'd be like. It just me. It's got to be Aaron genius. It must be Aaron genius because I don't get what yeah. he's doing, and you need a structure. So then my 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 um director said to me, Aaron, you need to write down how to do it properly. I'm like, okay. So then I created what is what was first called the Sales King, the Ultimate System, and I started to put down some structure. Now while I was doing, it, I had some friends that were in different industries, and they're like, hey, Aaron, can we catch up and have coffee? And you know, what we can do that. And I'd catch up, and then the conversation became to, oh, I'm struggling with my business and sales. And then I just started to give them some tips, and then you know, eventually they just kept wanting to catch up. Can I catch up again? Can I keep talking? Can I keep talking? <laughs> and then, and then I was like, cool, cool, cool. But eventually I was like, this is kind of really eating into my lunch. I just want to eat my salad, leave you alone. And then I kind of went, okay, I need to do something about this. And I remember it was one moment where I, I, I had a friend of mine and, um, and she was a PT and I had a few people as I was helping, but she, 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 I was at lunch with her and I gave her a couple of things and she's a brilliant example. Great PT knows 
everything about fucking every muscle there is but would go back into the gym and was the worst closer in a gym of 15 personal trainers there were people in there that barely passed their pt school had no idea crushing sales crushing it right so she's frustrated she has she has lunch with me give her a couple of tips she calls me that night and she goes oh my gosh i've had three people that i've met today aaron they've all bought 10 packs i'm like what's a 10 pack she's like they buy 10 you know personal training sessions up front 10, three of them. She's like, I've got a thousand dollars in my hand. I'm like, oh, cool. She's like, you, I don't care. Whatever you do in the next day, so I'm going to buy you lunch. I want to get more. So then we caught up, right? This, but get what she did. She brought her friend. So I'm sitting there with two friends. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then this happened. And then there was like three people. Then I'm doing this mini meetings in, in a cafe. I'm like, what's going on here? I'm just on my lunch break. Because I wasn't officially doing this. But I, 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 I started to do some consulting on the side. So I registered my ABN. I was doing some consulting on the side of working full time because I realized people needed this stuff. And then my first seminar um, was uh, when I was, I said, listen, this is probably getting a little bit too big. Why don't we book a room? And she said, I'll book the room. And I walked in, there were four people sitting down. There was a flip chart. I didn't even know how to use a flip chart. And then they were like, okay, let's learn some stuff. And so I then kind of pulled out some notes of the system that I created when I was working for somebody else. And um, I started to teach the first iteration of what was called the, the ultimate system. The sales king is what actually um, somebody called me in the media. They said to me, we're here with Aaron. He's the sales king. I was like, oh, that's cool. And everyone kept calling me the sales king. So I know okay, that will do. And so I kind of stuck for me with me. But yeah, that was my probably my first event. Um, and then obviously from there, it's, you know, I've, I've been very blessed to do stadiums of, you know, 20, 25,000 people yeah, amazing. and everything in between and, and, and do it a lot. I mean, I've been doing it for 15 years, but I mean, there's some years I was on a plane, I was in 22 countries. I was in front of, you know, uh, I was in front of a hundred thousand people in a year. Like, it's just, you know, it was insane. And, uh, and I've had a very deep experience now in that in many countries in many languages and being translated um, and not always my jokes sticking as well. You know, when you're trying to translate your jokes yeah, as, yeah, well, yeah. as well. Uh, and so for me, that was probably my first. Yeah. So back then was my first kind of my first one, um, and then I started to try and get a little bit more formal with it. And then I started to charge because I'm like, I need to charge for my time to do mm. this. And then I just act like I didn't go, I didn't go to the coach and the speaker. No one said to me, do a funnel, do a this, then do a that. No one said to me that. I didn't know that stuff. I just kind of worked it out. And then, and then eventually I kind of went, I, 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 I'm going to, I, I, I like to consult on the side of what I was building my business. And the reason why I love, my journey as a, as a coach and a mentor, because as a mentor, what I've basically done, Ryan, is when I very first started my businesses, so I, I, I sucked at tons of business, except guess what? Sales and marketing. So while I was doing my businesses, I would teach sales and marketing while I was trying to, while I was doing sales and marketing my businesses and I was failing at everything else. Then when I got good at other things in my business, I then went and taught that. And so my career, my career seesawed yeah. as a mentor because I started off in sales. Then I learned sales. I then learned about how to build a team. So I brought about, I taught about team. Then I learned about marketing. Then I went and taught marketing. And then eventually I learned how to build multiple businesses. And I, then I started to teach that. So I just have kind of done it and then mm -hmm. gone, this is gold. I'm going to go and teach it to people now. Oh, this is gold. Yeah. I'm going to go teach it to people now. And that just kept happening. You know, that just kept happening. And, and, and that's how the kind of career has gone side by side, which is the reason why the last eight years I've really got known as the empire guy, because when I started to teach people about building multiple businesses, I'd already had, uh, you know, maybe eight, nine, 10 businesses by then, something like that. And now, of course, you know, we built it to 50. So I just taught what I knew when I took it to the market and said, do you want to learn this stuff? So, yeah, that was my first my first one. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was and I, I had all the same issues that your listeners probably have. I thought, who am I? What do I have to teach? Uh, mm. And what was really interesting is sometimes I'd say to myself things like, who am I? What do I have to teach? Why would they believe me? And I already had success, you know, but I just yeah. you know, crossed the syndrome. I had self-doubt. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I, I worked out. I, I worked out really early on that at the end of the day, why did I become a mentor? Because there's some things that I know that people really need to know. And who am I to get in the way of sharing with people 
what could help them in their business. I've had people, many people, many, many people who have said to me that what they've learned in my, my, it's my seminars and my mentoring and my mastermind programs have literally saved their life. I've had people that have sent me the most amazing messages. Like I was, you know, I was suicidal. I was this, I was that. I came to your event to learn it, to learn, to learn about business. Yeah, yeah. The other side going, oh my gosh, I changed my life. Aaron, you, you know, I didn't jump off the, the, the side of the road, you know, because of everyone sitting there going, what? Yeah. I didn't get into mentoring to be some kind of self-help guru. I'm, I didn't, I'm not Dr. Phil. I'm not, how does this stuff happen? And I realized that I have what I call a deep level of obligation to help and share with other people. It's actually not a choice for me to go out there and decide to be a mentor. It's a deep obligation I have to share with other people how they can live their life by design and not by default and to share with them the things that I know work in business. And because I've done them, I have a bit of a reputation for being one of the hardest mentors around, which I don't take shit. I will tell people what they need to do and I don't give a shit about their excuses. And that's not because... I don't care about them. It's because I care about them more than the next person because yeah. I give a shit about their success. I'm going to tell them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And, and I'm going to hold them to account to change their life because I have a deep level of obligation because mm. when they come to say, oh, Aaron, I can't, I have this problem and this problem. I'm sitting there going, I've got the same fucking problems I've been through. So yeah. I found a way out of it. Do this, 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 and this, and you're going to be able to get there. And if you find a deeper level of obligation, I think that anything's possible in life. So for me, those out there that say, Aaron, I'm not sure about whether I should ask that person to buy my product. If you don't believe in the product that you sell in the company that you work for, then quit today. Today, quit. And if you're good at sales, I'll hire. No problem, right? I've got lots of companies, right? Hit me up, right? But here's the thing. If you don't believe in the, in, I don't give a shit what you learn from me or from you. If you don't believe in the product, it's going to come through in some way and you're mm-hmm. not going to be able to make the money and you're not going to be able to make the commission. So quit. If you have a business that provides a product or service that can really help people, then that's the number one thing you have to remember when you're thinking about going out there and selling to somebody. Is if you don't go and sell your product or service, then what's that going to mean in their life? Mm-hmm. Who are they going to become? If I don't go out there and if I've got a media business that can create great websites or whatever, and I don't go out there and sell that to that person, what's going to happen? I've got a retail brand where I do bespoke suits. If I know that suit's going to help them to be able to close more deals or to be able to feel better, like we have some over the Sansoni collection, which is my, my retail um, suit brand. And it's literally designed around influence and persuasion. It's designed to wear suits and shirts colors, patterns, and everything that actually can increase your sales because we know that colors, patterns, and things yep. that you wear, it does actually have a, an effect on influence and persuasion. So I'm the first guy in the world to create the very first world's first influence, tailor-made influence collection. So if one of my tailors is sitting in front of someone that, oh, I don't think I want to buy that shirt or not, they've got an obligation to say, listen, mm. if you could just enhance your sales just a little bit, don't we need to get this for you today? Isn't this, shouldn't this be that next thing you get? Or in any one of what I, what, I, what I do, this is why I need to believe in my products. I need to believe in my services. My team need to believe my products and services as well because that's what changes the game for people, I think, when I do it. So for me, it, it, it became an obsession of going out there and living. That's why when I'm on stage, and, and I don't know if you've been to my events, I'm, I am the straightest shooter, the most direct person you'll ever see on stage because I have done this for so long. I can look at a person by what they're wearing, how they're sitting, what they're doing, what they're not doing. And I know what they think, what they what they know, what their challenges are because I've done it so much that I want to yeah. just get out there and say, here's your problem. And I'm not going to fuck around. I'm going to tell you what you need to get done. And if you want to learn and grow, then let's get this thing done. Let's make it happen because people's life is going way too quickly and they don't realize it and i'm sick of meeting people in their 60s 70s and 80s that wish they could go back to their 20s and get their life back again and people don't take that serious enough time take life easy take life with some fun but take your time super serious and and get educated and if you've got a business or a product and you can believe in it you've got to do everything you can to get it in people's hands and that's why i believe i really do believe in sales, and I'll, I'll give it to you as well. I'll, t- I'll tell you this, and, I, and, I, and I'll tell you for everyone listening. In terms of teaching people, uh, with, with like you teach them about sales, the people that teach sales and marketing and branding, do you know what the hardest thing to sell is? Sales. Sales. <laughs> you want to know why? Because everyone thinks they're fucking brilliant at it and they're full of shit. 
They're not. It's the last thing, the last thing. I had the biggest promoter in the world that owns the biggest promoting company in the world, which I used to tour with. He said to me, Aaron, the hardest thing to sell in my stages is sales because everyone thinks that they know it. That yeah. blows me away. The yeah. thing that generate the most amount of money, that's where you should be spending money, right? If you can go and increase your sales by five or 10%, I'm sure that you talk about this when you're selling your products and services. I'm like, it's no brainer investment to be going and investing into yourself and buying this kind of a stuff and doing this because you can change your life by doing it. So for mm -hmm. me, look, I get passionate about people's possibilities. I have I have a zero tolerance for, for people that bring up excuses on why they can't to get to where, where they wanna go. I'm really upfront with, with where I think people can be and where, what their potential is. And, and I think that we, we don't give ourselves permission enough to go out there and start that business, to go out there and be the number one on the leaderboard in that sales team. We walk in and we go, oh, that guy or that girl, she's number mm. one. I don't think I'm going to get there. Walk up to them and say, can I buy your coffee? Tell me the three things that you're doing really, really well. Why do people not walk into a gym and walk over the person that has the abs, the shoulders, the biceps that you want and say, can I, can I ask you two questions? How did you do that? We don't do it. What do we do? We stand over here and go, oh, easy for them they probably work out tomorrow. yeah 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 we might right? so yeah. if you're in sales go up to the person that's crushing and say give me two things mm. give me two things right but and it's the same with business i just think that people need to wake up give themselves permission to become better and also give themselves permission to fail give themselves permission to stuff up you might go teach them a line they need to say to go and close or a paragraph or something go try it what's your worst you're going to get no thanks yeah thanks you know, let's go to the next person. Give themselves, people are going to give themselves permission to fail more. You know, we live in this society where if we fail, we think that everyone's going to laugh at us and we're going to get, who gives a shit if they do? You know what I mean? Who gives a shit if, you know, if you're going to get doubters and haters and disbelievers, it doesn't matter what you do. You may as well play full out. Because one thing I do tell people is that the more successful you become, eventually, number one, you won't give a shit. And number two, they stop hating as much. Because you just become the success. Eventually, they just shut the fuck up and it happens, right? And I think that people need to understand that. So if I can give you something, I know that I've answered your question way more than what you've asked, but I think that if I can give you something, people can give themselves permission to just win and to fail. Your listeners and your viewers are going to change their life through that. Just win and fail. You know, not Don't try and be right all the time. Don't try and win all the time. And the amount of money I've wasted businesses are default. I was been interviewed recently uh, for Forbes. because they want to do an article on me. And the woman was like, oh, Aaron, 50 businesses. That's so amazing. I said, to, I said, yeah, but do you want to tell me, do you want me to tell you about the 150 that I've started that haven't worked out? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, like yeah, there's 50 yeah. going real well, but let me tell you about the ones that haven't. I haven't started 55 businesses and 50 worked out, right? I've yeah. tried to start and partner and buy and things have gone right. I've lost money. I've tried this. I've had people take things from me and embezzle and you name it. I've had it happen. I've just done it lots of times. So mm. my, my, my win percentage gets better, just like in sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This percentage gets better as you get better as well. So I think, yeah, I do. I think, look, permission for me is probably one of the biggest things I think people are miss, missing. So those who want to go out there and sell more and do more and, 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 and allow themselves to stand on stages or go out there and be the number one salesperson or go out there and you know, start their own business, you got to remember that the the worst thing you think that can happen will probably not happen. And even if it does, you've survived all of your challenges to this point and you'll survive the rebuild stage of the next thing. Yeah, nice. And you'll have all the knowledge that you've gained along the way as well. Um, mate, last, last few minutes, and there's one area that I really want to kind of touch on um, because um, as I, as again, as I did my research, uh, I understand that when you're, um, you had a child at uh, three months old and you were on a plane flying around left, right, and center all around the world. And, uh, and, it, and it literally mirrored my life in 2018, pre COVID. I'd, I'd finally got over this fear of public speaking. And, and I did 188 events um, in, in, in 2018 or 2000, 2019 before COVID. I was getting some momentum of enjoying it. And I had a baby um, and I spent a lot of time away from him and, uh, and then COVID hit and it went right. No more public speaking, but spend time with Bob, which so there's double edged sword, right? It was a, it was almost a blessing. How did you cope with that all right, going on in your life? Like being connected with the family and spending so much time away. And it's probably a selfish question, really. Yeah. Look, I think for me, and I, I understand totally because it was for me, it was a few years before, before your 
yeah. your time of doing it. But I remember my specific time, um, I actually used to count events per year. Now I really don't um, because I lose count. Uh, but what I what I remember, there was one year and it was when my daughter was was born. She was young. She's eight now. And uh, it was that year. It was it was about she was about about six months, about six months old. And I ended up traveling um, for about a year and I spent 121 days of that year in another country in a hotel. And that was because I was growing my venture cap capital firm. I had opportunities to go around the world and, and um, to do that and build my connections. And I was doing a ton of speaking and events around the world as well. And look, for me, that wasn't the most enjoyable year because I was away from my family for a lot for that year, but it meant that I was, I was able to set myself up. And I think that people have to understand that, that life stages as well. And right now you might be in the stage where you can't be the best mum or dad. You can't be at every rehearsal. You can't pick them up all the time. You can't be there every time at drop off. You might be the parent that, that, that people say when you pick up, oh, where have you been? I haven't seen you in so long. You know what I mean? And you might have to cop that. I always say to people, if you want to you wanna see judgment, go to a school drop-off, right? And that'll be, <laughs> that'll, that'll be coming for you soon, right? <laughs> yeah. I think that, that, I think that, that I, I think that you've got to work out the stage you're in. And I think for me, I know I had to do that there and th there when she was kind of six months to like one and a half. Now I was there for two thirds of the year, but I was traveling quite a bit. Yeah because I had to. And then, you know what, in the last couple of years, even before COVID, I didn't have to go anywhere. I'd have to travel anyway, because I had businesses, I had networks, I had teams, I had revenue, I didn't have to go and travel. So I, I, I just think sometimes people, if you're looking at your feet the whole time, it's really hard to see the sunrise, right? Mm. And, and, and you've got to see what's coming up. Like what stage are you in right now? Are you in the work like crazy stage for a year or two? Are you in this stage for the year or two? And the other thing I'll say on this is I think people have this, they always talk about this work-life balance. And I think it's bullshit, right? Work-life balance is bullshit in the 21st century. You don't switch off at nine o'clock, you know, five o'clock and start again. It's not work-life balance. I call it work-life blend, right? And what I mean by that is that you might need to take a phone call at 10 o'clock at night. Mm. You might need to do, uh, an, you know, when you do an event for you, you might need to do something on Saturday in the afternoon where you might be normally doing a little league, whatever. But you yeah. know what? You might be able to sit there with your son and, and play Lego at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday too. You might be able to take the family for lunch on a Thursday. Why do you have to take the family for lunch only on the weekend? Why can you only do that? It's a blend. As long as you're adding the right ingredients into that blend and, and you're prioritizing being present with them when you're with them, then to me, that's the most important thing for you. Because here's the thing, who you become as a parent, as a mom, as a dad, as a, as a human will reflect massively on the outcomes you have with your children. And I know that I'm a better dad because I had to travel back then. Mm. I know I'm a better husband because I had to hustle back then. And because of those reasons, I know I'm better now. I mean, if I want to, I can take off a year. I can do this. I can do that. I've got the yeah. ability to do that, to do the best for the ones I love the most and to be able to take care of them when they're going through those challenges. So I think you've got to, you've got to know the state that you're at. I think that's a really, yeah. really important thing. And I think when, when we, we get that, you, you know, things in your life will happen that make sense. You know, like for me, I had some challenging news uh, a few years ago, about three years ago now, where my mother was diagnosed with, with, with cancer and she had to have a double mastectomy and she you know, had lymph nodes and a whole bunch of things. And it was a really challenging time for us as a family. And I'll tell you this, Ryan, I don't care what I've had to do up until this point. I realized in that conversation where my mom told me, and I you know, cried for about 20 minutes and I ended up calling her back because I just, I literally couldn't speak to her. And I said to her, these words run, I said to my mum, these words that changed, that made sense, to, that made my life make sense to me. I said to my mum, I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll take care of it. I said, mum, whatever doctor you need, whatever surgeon you need, what are the best care you need, I will take care of it. I'll, whatever you need. You know, mm. to this day, whatever doctor bills you, I will take care of it. And you know what? What if I had just an ordinary job where yeah. I wasn't making much money and my mum called and I couldn't say to my mum, I'll take care of it and mm. I'll get you the best help you need. So if I didn't do what I did, Ryan, those years before it, I wouldn't be able to say those words to my mum when she needed me the most. And I wouldn't change anything I've been through to be able to say to my mum, 
that when you're going through the biggest battle of your life as your son, I will take care of you and be there for you. And I think if you just start to see where your life is and what you're trying to build it for and who you're trying to build it for and, and, and get your head out of the fog of, the, of today, mm. I think that you start to see what you're trying to build and why you're trying to build it. I think you get more energy from that too, because you know where you're trying to go. So that would, that's probably what I would say to you is that life is a blend. Don't feel like the worst person in the world because you're on your phone sometimes at night. And, and also don't think you always have to work nine to five when you work for yourself. You're allowed to take some time off in between that as well. You can be your own boss and do that. And so I think life is a blend. It's not a balance because if you have a, if you try to get this balance where you don't talk about work after this, you don't do that. What you actually end up doing is resenting your work yeah. or your business or resenting your family for taking yeah from making money or whatever it's a blend just make sure you're adding the right ingredients to that blend nice mate that's 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 amazing analogy and, and also uh, thanks for sharing about your mom as well it makes makes total sense um i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap this up because i like i said i'm really respectful of your time and grateful for you coming on and, um, and the final thing i just want to touch on is um the Entrepreneur Summit um, event tour. Now you've got um, a lady that joins you pretty regularly. So you must be very good friends by now. Yeah, we're good um, friends. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. Ir- ironically, Janine, um, I, I don't know how much you know, but we um, we went on to Shark Tank in 2018. Right. We took this, this business on the show. Mm. Um, she did make an offer. Um, and unfortunately, she didn't come on board, but we got Steve, Andrew and Glenn. Um, so. Awesome. Um, remind I, know, I know Glenn well too. I know Glenn um, and uh, and Naomi. Yeah, they're all they're all amazing. I'm I'm very blessed to to know most of the sharks and and to do and to partner with 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 a bunch of them as well. So yeah, well, I'm doing a tour. Um, and if you want to find out, they can just yeah. jump on my Instagram. Um, like probably the best place on there. And there's a, there's a there's a little link on, in in the bio there. Uh, so Janine, yeah, I've known Janine for many years. Janine Ellis, uh, we've done. Oh, 40 events together we just we have so much fun uh and we love hanging out and uh and uh, or auntie janine as my my daughter calls her or she used to call her the boost juice lady then she just started yeah, yeah. Auntie janine. Uh, so yeah we'll be on tour so if people are in uh brisbane sydney melbourne and fingers crossed perth uh yeah. we can go over there we're going to be going over for tour entrepreneur summer and tickets like 47 bucks and you get to bring a person along with you as well um i playful out you know and the whole time i'm there so absolutely they can they can go over to my instagram at aaron sansoni on my handle go on um you know check out some stuff i do over there as well and uh come and hang out at the entrepreneur summer there's a, yeah there's a link there um that they mm. can go and they can grab tickets we'll, we'll, we'll share it on here as well guys um, yeah. um on the uh at the bottom of this yeah, uh, not, gold, not gold coast will be on there no gold coast yeah, no Gold Coast. We're just trying to stay away from anyone that has really nice beaches. There's a bit of a punishment <laughs> for, for, for me living in Melbourne and not having the nice beaches down here as well. So we we do we just with that with my schedule, I actually used to do I've done used to do Gold Coast and I did Townsville and I did all these yeah. kind of smaller places. And I really do sometimes miss just getting out there and doing some of those places. Just with our schedule now, with mine and Janine's schedule now, we just I mean it's a struggle to try and make it happen. You know, for us to to find dates where Jean and I can both. <laughs> Does all the thing. And she do yeah, she's coming to every one yeah. of them. Yeah. So, yeah. So like to find dates that I can get Janine to come with me or whoever I'm touring with, it's just, I spend 70% of my time or more doing what I teach, right? Like if I was a full-time mentor speaker, man, every weekend I'll be able to jump on a plane and do these events. But I, I, I only get to do these tours a couple of times a year. And that's why when I do, I play full out. Uh, I have a lot of fun when I do it. And uh, and I just give, you know, that's my, this isn't when we're here to talk, you know, your, your podcast is about sales. I mean, sales is an exchange of value. You know, if somebody's paying $5, but they feel like they're getting $15 in, in perceived or real value, well then happy days, you know, and that's, that's how the thing works. So for me, um, I play full out um, and um, we have a lot of fun along the way. So look, I love to see their faces. I love to hear their stories and uh, and help them along their journey as well uh, to be able to become better salespeople, better leaders and better business owners if they are or transitioning to become a business owner. I work a lot with people that want to start a company too and uh, and build the empire dream, right? You know, have you know, have a life by design and not by default and build an empire of multiple businesses and uh, multiple streams of income. So Janine and I will definitely be talking about that. And uh, so the Entrepreneur Summit Tour, yeah, four cities, not the Gold Coast, maybe we'll do another time. Uh, and, uh, and they can head over, yeah, my Instagram page will have a link on there for all the details. 
Amazing, amazing. That is a great way to wrap up. Um, what an exchange of value. 45 minutes of their time to listen to this and, and an absolute lifetime of value from yourself. Aaron, um, sincerely, mate, pleasure having you on board and thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much to everyone of your listeners that's listened to this and thank you for, for inviting me on as well. I appreciate that.